Hello and welcome to the Folklore Podcast Book Club, YouTube-based programming from the Folklore Podcast, which looks at books, authors and publishers whose work intersect with the field of folklore. In today's episode, I'm joined by author Tom Phillips, who talks about his book, Forest Folk Tales for Children. Welcome, Tom, to the Folklore Podcast Book Club. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. So we are going to talk today about your folklore book for children, which we can both wave at the camera now. Look, <laughs> Forest Folk Tales, Forest Folk Tales for Children, which is published by the History Press. Uh, and I'm going to hazard a guess that because you are an ex-primary school teacher, you chose to go with the children's folklore book rather than uh, going in a different direction. So in order to see whether I'm right or wrong in this fact, I'm going to ask you to just tell us a little bit about yourself and that background that you have and uh, how you have now moved from that into storytelling. Yes, so um, I started, I grew up in a house full of kids. My mum was a child, my and my dad worked at the local primary. And then when I turned 18, uh, my first full-time job was a teaching assistant in a primary school. Um, and it just kind of stumbled on from there. I worked in outdoor ed quite a bit. I spent some time in Wales, um, various places. And then I did my teacher qualification when I was a bit older, um, mature student. I, I wouldn't have classed myself as a mature student. Um, it took me five years to complete a three year course because I had a two year break. Uh, teaching, although I loved the whole working with children thing, I knew I was good with a class of children. It was all the extra bits around it that I, I struggled with. And so I thought at the end of the day, let's get a degree. Let's, let's you know, that, that'll help me go forward. I became a teacher um, and growing up, I always liked stories. I always liked, I always rem remember my dad reading the Enid Blyton Br'er Rabbit stories to me. Um, I always liked storytelling. I loved the Jim Henson Storyteller um, program that was on back in the late 80s. And as a, as a teacher, I started to tell some of these stories on a Friday afternoon to my class, you know, the last 10 minutes or so, I know I'll tell you a story and I'd leave them on a cliffhanger and then you'd have to wait another week. And, and I really enjoyed it and started looking into it and realized it's not just for kids that you can do it, storytelling to adults. And so I went along to Nottingham to the old trip to Jerusalem where, um, Pete Davis, who's no longer with us, he ran a storytelling club and I had my first go at telling stories to adults. Um, the 10 minute story went on for 20 minutes. I nearly broke an invaluable fertility chair by jumping on it. Um, <laughs> it was quite a, an interesting moment. I jumped on it and everyone gasped. <gasps> I had no idea what I'd done until afterwards. Um, but I got the bug. And so I carried on telling and I, I traveled around and told at these various clubs. Um, and in the background, I was writing. I have always written. Um, I remember at school, I, I liked writing, but I never finished stories. That was my biggest thing. And I, I started writing, got excited, never finished. I got a few um, children's stories, a few picture books that I worked on and they were just sat there kind of thing one day I might get it published and then teaching came to an end I, I it run its course I, I had enough with all the extra you know wasn't having a weekend my kids weren't seeing me that kind of thing so I jacked all that in started working at an events venue for a couple of years building on experience of working in pubs and restaurants for for 10 years and then moved into the heritage sector. I now um, I'm the operations supervisor at the Moira Furnace Museum in the middle of the National Forest. And throughout all of this, I say I was storytelling and I, I was writing. And then um, someone else who uh, you'll know and a lot of storytelling enthusiasts will know, uh, Dave Tong, a friend of mine, 
he announced that he was writing this book for History Press. And I thought, oh, I could do that. These are folk tales for children. I, I want to write children's stuff. I I've written children's stuff and just not got it published. So I hit Dave up for the contacts and um, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I thought about you where, um, when they were talking to me. So here's the, here's the contacts. Good luck. I fired off three stories to the History Press one after another going i'd love to write this book about leicestershire folk tales for children because i live in leicestershire born and bred in leicestershire i know all these quirky little things these little folk tales from where where i live as as well as the rest of leicestershire and after three stories were sent the, the history press came back and said yeah we like your style um we'll, we'll let you write the book and so i started writing leicestershire folk tales for children and i just found it came really easy it was just that whole storytelling I, I i told the story in words the way i would tell the story orally and that came out and that was a success i did a book launch with that um and a couple of illustrators that i worked with um and then i started working at more furnace museum and i wanted another book out there and i had the idea i work in the middle of the national forest why don't I see if they want forest folk tales for children? You know, I'm based in a forest. Uh, there was a, a festival that happens down the road from where I work called the Timber Festival. It was supposed to be its third year, third year, fourth year this year. Unfortunately, with everything that's happened, it's um, it didn't happen. But I said to the History Press, I said, I've got contacts at this festival. I can do a book launch at this Timber Festival. It's all about woodlands and forests and nature and that kind of thing and they said yeah that's great we'll we'll go with it although there's other people who had the same idea similar idea we'll, we'll go with you um however this was october the festival was the beginning of july the next year they wanted the final copies by the first of january so i have two and a half months to write 22,000 words for for the book needless to say my family didn't see much of me over Christmas mm. I was sat on my bed with books piled around me folktale books and trying in the hardest part wasn't working out the the stories but working out what forests I was going to include it's not until you start looking at a map of, of Britain you realize how many forests there are and some forests you didn't even realize were forests and so uh, that's it really it came out last year and it's been steadily ticking over since then and every now and then i get a lovely review in and it's, it's really exciting and and then someone asked me to do this and you know it's it's fantastic yeah and it's a it is a lovely book and i do like um the uh, the illustrations for this which are kind of woodcut woodcut style um i think yeah. work really well um now you you break the book down into themes don't you so i've just turned to ghostly beasts for example uh king's curses and colluders fairies dragons and so on you've got a theme per forest yeah so what i what i did is the reference books i use the the one I like the most, the one I keep going back to, it's, um, let's see, check the bibliography, it's Simpson, the Westwood and Simpson, The Law of the Land. Law of the Land. I love yep. that book. Yeah, beautiful book. Um, and I always, that's my go-to book. And I started looking through there and a few of the other folktale books that I had. And I noticed that there weren't really many folk tales based in forests at first and i'm thinking why is that i think well that goes back to the fact that forests are scary and we stayed out of forests and forests you know the settlements cropped up around the edge of forests but you've got the going back to the, the well-known stories like little red riding hood it's there telling you to stay out of the forest else the big bad wolf will get you it's those kind of things and hansel and gretel the scary forest so I thought, well, okay, let's get the stories around the edge of the forest because a lot of them happen in the forest. And then I started to find there were themes, natural themes. 
the first time it twigged was I was looking at uh, Gainsborough and Great Dolby Forest in Yorkshire. And I suddenly realised there were a load of stories about hobs. Um, for those who don't know what a hob is, it's, it's essentially a house elf. J.K. Rowling nicked the idea for, from that. She took that and renamed them little hairy men that, that live in your house. You don't know they're there. They tidy up and they get very offended if you try and clothe them because they go around naked. I thought, oh, there's one here and there's one here and there's one here. And they all cluster around the, these forests. And then I thought, well, North Wales is, is dragons. It's got to be dragons. And North Wales is, is covered in low-lying forests that are actually rainforests because of the amount of rain. And then I noticed there were witches and wizards in um, around Monmouth and um, the Forest of Dean there. And, and so it just kind of it, it grew from there, really. And, and I thought, well, that would be a great way to, to chapter the book, really, having these themes based around these forests. So how did you generate the style of stories that you use when you're telling for children because some stories can be quite dark some can be quite complex and it depends on your sources and where you're getting stories from whether you're collecting them orally whether they're coming from books like law of the land for example uh, and other places um and you want a consistent style then for for your style of telling uh so how did you adapt the stories that you're collecting to form this collection um I'm a big believer when it, in storytelling, you tell the stories that speak to you. Um, by all means, try a story and if it doesn't work, it falls flat, that, that's fine. That, that's not your story. That's not one for you to tell. Um, and that's fine. So all the stories that I know anyway and that I tell, they tend to be ones that resonate with me, ones that have a bit of humour, a bit of darkness to them. I, I think it's very important for children to be scared um, whilst reading stories or listening to stories because it's a safe space. They can be scared within the story and learn how to cope with being scared. And then when they're scared in real life, they know how to deal with it because they've learned through the story. Um, and then for the, for the style of the stories in my book, uh, it's just a case of finding the story and just playing with it in in my head it's just it goes round and round in my head and you know how will i tell this how will i make this relatable for an eight nine year old i'm lucky that i've got a seven year old daughter um who's very uh literate and very um she was speaking before she was one you know <laughs> you know um my four-year-old boy's a bit too young, but my daughter, I would try these stories on her, although she was younger than my target audience, she had the understanding. You know, not to brag or anything, but this morning we'd uh, invented a new game instead of badminton, it was bardminton, where we, uh, we threw William Shakespeare quotes at each other. <laughs> Brilliant. I was amazed my seven-year-old daughter knew them. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, so it just kind of develops from there and I guess when I get typing I just kind of get in the zone and boom. Some of the stories in the book are traditional, they, they're pretty much lifted from the page of where I found them and tweaked and put my own words, this is my own telling. And some of the stories are stories that are very personal to me. So the Robin Hood story for example mm. um i wanted to tell a story of robin hood that wasn't a regular story people wouldn't have heard now this story i first heard told by pete davies who was all i've already mentioned from nottingham now he sadly passed away a few years ago so, so i tell this story in memory of him and the story is actually a jack story with a boggart but he told it because he's from Nottingham as Robin Hood and a giant cyclops. And it just works. It's comedic, it's scary in parts, but the hero wins. It links up a time before Robin Hood was famous to, to then when he meets his merry men and becomes famous. It, it kind of works. And although it's not 
an actual Robin Hood story. I think especially with children, it, the sources to me don't really matter. It's if it's a good story and it fits and it works, that's all children really want. So you've you've got a fair few themes that you've that you've told stories on. I'll just run through the ones from the contents page of the book. So you've covered hobs, dragons, fairies, king's curses and colluders, ghostly beasts, Robin Hood, as you say, witches and wizards, trees, and the green man. So the, there's obviously a couple of themes here. Um, the, there's a kind of a nature theme, obviously. It is forest folk tales, after all. And, and kind of a bit of a supernatural creature theme there with ghostly beasts, uh, hobs, dragons, and so on. Uh, which was your particular favourite to work with? Um, I always liked dragon stories. Um, for a long time, my logo was a dragon. I have a dragon. Um, he's not here. He's he's flown off somewhere. Dennis, my dragon. Um, so I like those. But the... <sighs> I do like, although I like the nature stories, I do like the supernatural side of things. Um, I am a skeptic, however, I, I'm a skeptilever. I want to believe, although I'm skeptic. You know, the place I managed, Moira Furnace, it's 200 plus years old and it was lived in up until the 1970s. And I've done a few paranormal investigations there. And there is definitely something there. You know, I've had a door slam on me and that kind of thing. Um, so I really enjoy those spooky ones. I think my favourite story out of all of them was the, it was the beasts in Thetford Forest. Um, I can't remember what I called it now, but, uh, you know, I wrote this book two years ago. Now it's, one of, it's one of those, <laughs> you do interviews and things and you think, oh, I can't remember now. It's been a while since, uh, uh, what's it called? The Legend of the Beast of Southery. Um, again, with Thetford Forest um, being quite a new forest, uh, I had to, you know, be a bit fast and loose with with the locations. But Southery is right at the edge of Thetford and that kind of thing. Um, but I really like that. It's it's in the vein of uh, Black Shook and you know the Shag Dog stories of the big black beasts and that phantom beast. And I, I like that. I like the whole. They go from menacing horrible snarling creatures to a protector of the righteous and I quite, I quite like that so that was my favorite excellent so by way by way of illustration I'm, I'm going to ask you to tell one of the stories from the book you don't have to read it you can tell it in your own style you are a storyteller after all um because I want to use that to, to talk a little bit afterwards about the the way that you follow on from these stories so um I'm going to mute myself for a couple of minutes uh, and just give you an opportunity to tell one of the stories from the book. So away you go. Thank you. So I'm going to tell uh, this one. It's the Gwaiba of Penmachno. And it's a story from North Wales. Uh, I love Wales. Wales is one of my favourite places to be. North Wales is beautiful, rugged and quite sparse up on the, the mountain tops. Now in North Wales they call dragons guibers and this comes from uh, snakes, adders. It's believed that if an adder drinks the milk of a human mother then it turns into a dragon, a guiber. And there was one such guiber, a huge creature it was. It had decided to make its home high on a cliff above a river near Betsy Cuid. And down below, the villagers were worried. You see, the dragon would often fly off and pick out the cattle from the field and feast on the horses and the sheep and maybe burn some of the crops. Nobody wanted to do anything about it because they were too scared. And then, then a rogue, an outlaw came to town and saw a chance to redeem himself maybe he could become a hero in this part of town so he decided he was going to go and slay the dragon but being quick of wit 
he decided to go and ask the local wise man who it was told could foresee your death and he thought if i go to the wise man and he tells me that the dragon's going to kill me then i'm not going to go and try and kill this dragon so he goes to the wise man and he sits down and he says oh wise man he said please tell me how am i going to die and the wise man he stroked his long beard because all wise men have to have long beards and he said you are going to die through poisoning them it will course through your veins and stop your heart and the man left and he thought to himself hmm, hold on a guaiba comes from an adder and adders are poisonous they, they've got venom maybe there's something in this he thought i know i'll disguise myself and i'll go back again and ask him a second time and if he still says i'm going to die through venom then i know i shouldn't do it and so he disguises himself with a pair of glasses and a fake big nose and off he goes back into the old man's hut and he asks the old man how he's going to die and the old man once again stroked his beard and he said oh you you are going to die through a broken neck it'll be shattered in many places and so the man left and he took off his fake uh, glasses and his nose and he thought what a crock of rubbish this, this, this old man doesn't know what he's talking about. I'll try one more time just to be sure that he's talking rubbish. And so this time he dresses in a dress, long hair and bosoms. And off he goes and he sits there and he says, wise man, how am I going to die, please? And the wise man stroked his beard and he said, you are going to drown. The water will fill your lungs and push the air out and you will rest at the bottom of the water. And so the man left and he derobed and he thought, what a load of rubbish. I'm safe. I'm not going to get killed by a dragon. And so he took his sword, his trusty sword, and he went to attack the dragon. Now, he didn't go the normal route to the top of the cliff. He decided to climb up the cliff straight up. Now, the the guaiba surely wouldn't expect this, he thought. But as he mantled the top of the cliff, he hauled himself up to see the dragon face to face with him, waiting for him. The dragon, the guaiba, as quick as a snake, for that's what it once was, bit the man on his shoulder and he felt the venom start to pulse through his veins oh he cried and he let go of the cliff and he tumbled down and backwards and round through the air until his head met a rock and he snapped his neck clean in two but just before the life left him his body hit the river below and there in the water his lungs began to fill with liquid and the air left his body and poisoned with a broken neck, he drowned. And so ends my story. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Uh, now, what I like about the stories, <coughs> excuse me, what I like about the stories in this book is that they are followed by a couple of other things. So after each story, you have a little bit that says, did you know? And then you have a bit on the other side that says, why don't you? So, so one of these is what some extra facts about the area in which you set the story and those sorts of things. Is that right? Yes, it's just little interesting tidbits and that kind of stuff. Um, so talking with the history press, uh, they said, oh, we're trying, we'd like, we want a bit of a different um, feel to, to these books going forward. They're going to be hardback rather than paperback. We're going to use in-house illustrators we're going to source the illustrators rather than you sourcing them um and we want to be a bit more interactive and can you use your right uh, teacher background to do this and how about some facts and things so i thought ideal that i can do that and so yeah the, the did you know is is something based around the area so like i said the snowdonian forests actually being rainforests so something i didn't know 
interesting fact. And then the why don't you, again, that comes from being a teacher and from having kids of my own. And I want them to, to be inspired by the stories and, and go out into the forest and try these things. So the one, again, from, in Wales, it's why don't you go and fight a log dragon with a stick? Um, I'm always careful as well to put little caveats and, you know, don't fight each other and don't poke each other in the eye, that kind of thing. Yes. But, you know, <laughs> try and get them to, to get out there and, and, and play in nature and just enjoy being in those forests. Yes, that's it. It's, in, it's exploring the environment, isn't it? it? It's encouraging. Learning through play is a very important thing. Uh, and then you have things like, uh, yes, try to fight it with your friends using sticks as swords. Remember, though, you need to work together to overcome this foul beast, not hit each other with your swords. Teamwork is key. So, yes, it's teaching little lessons <laughs> as well. I, I guess this is your teacher background kind of sneaking through, isn't it? Uh, but, but I think that's brilliant um, because folk tales are are little kind of nuggets of education after all. You know, they they are used so many times to teach lessons and that's a good way of, of enhancing and establishing those lessons and things isn't it it's just by giving some extra activities that people can try there's a wonderful animation um narrated by Serene mckellen um that i absolutely love and i don't know if you've seen it it's about uh, the importance of stories and storytelling and it tells of uh, how the first storytellers came to be and it was cavemen and they go out and they they fight this uh saber-toothed cat and one of them gets killed and the other one manages to, to kill the saber-toothed cat and they go back and they, they tell this story and that story uh, becomes ingrained in in tradition and folklore of that tribe and they spread it around and but the key to that story is be careful out there the world is big and dangerous and it shows how uh, we learn, as you, as you say, from stories, from folk tales, and and that's why they they last, and that's the enduring nature of folk tales. We pass these on to our children, and and, and they learn from them, and hopefully learn important, valuable lessons that will keep them safe going forward. And even as adults, you know, we read them and go, oh yeah, that that that's a metaphor for this or the yes. you know yeah, yeah okay and, and we relate to them in that way excellent so what's next are you uh, tempted to write for the adult market or are you sticking with uh children's writing stick with kids <laughs> <laughs> um so what's next uh i need to I'm playing with an idea at the moment, um, speaking with another friend, author, friend of mine, Kat Weatherall, um, may be familiar with her work. She's a fantastic author, um, a good friend. And she's suggested I do something along the lines of um, folk tales for that dads can tell to their kids. Mm. Um, we've had a lot of story, a lot of books about um, females, her, uh, heroines and goddesses, and we've got most of those. And we, me and my daughter read most of those, you know, the rebellion, uh, bedtime stories of rebel girls and that kind of stuff. And Santi uh, Gresham's um, Goddesses and Heroines. That's a great book if you want to check that out. But um, yeah, so I'm playing with that idea. But I've also, for oh, how many years now? Well over a decade, if not 15 years or so, been trying to write a novel uh the first of three i've got a whole trilogy planned out in my head and i've spoken to many people about it i've got the first 12 13 chapters written which i want to go back and rewrite and the idea is to to finally one day get that finished try and get that published a proper book aimed at the the nine to twelve year old market and, and, and carry on and I'd also like to one day again these are all uh, one day I'd like to get some of my shorter stories some of my picture books um, published but just hoping that books like these help me if I go to publishers be able to say I've done that there's yeah. an example of what I've written um, absolutely so yeah. absolutely that, that's that's a great thing too to be able to do that, that and 
a good selection to be working on there as well, isn't it? I, I wish you every success with all of those. They'd be absolutely Thank wonderful. You. you must have had a chance because this has been out for a little while to do some live events using this book before we went into the kind of not live event scenario that we're in at the moment. Um, how did that go? How was it received? How does it work with, a, with a, an audience of kids in front of you? Yeah, so um, I've done a few. Uh, I always juggle work with storytelling, so I'm not a full-time uh, storyteller. It's I can never quite make the bills, uh, pay the bills with my storytelling, especially with the wife and, and, and kids. So I've always worked. Um, so the events have been sporadic, but when they have happened, it's been in schools and that kind of things. And, it's worked really well. What I tend to do is maybe tell one or two stories from here and then tell other stories that are similar of a similar nature that have nature links and that kind of thing or might have a dragon in and say, well, you know, I've got a whole chapter on dragons, that kind of thing. So the kids really, really engage and I've got quite an engaging way of telling to kids. I just kind of get a child audience, you know. I know some people say, oh, children, oh, a child audience scares me. For me, 100 kids in front of me, I'm happy. Give me a room of adults. That's when the nerves creep in. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. when I get worried. Because I'm sitting there thinking, are they judging me? What's going on? At least with mm -hmm. kids, if they get bored, you know, because they're sat there picking the nose, looking at the ceiling. You know, it's really <laughs> obvious. Um, so, yeah, it's gone down well. Um, and, yeah, hopefully when things start to return to normal, I can get out and do a bit more storytelling and, and promote the book a bit more. Let's hope so. Yeah, in the meantime, if people want to have a look at your uh, your work and other bits and pieces have you got an online presence that they should be looking at yes uh, it's it's mainly facebook um i was paying for a website for a bit but it's one of those it barely ever got looked at and i thought well i'm not bothering paying for that the majority of my work comes through facebook so if you want to check me out i'm on facebook as tom the tale teller so that's that's my storytelling alias tom the tale teller um and you can find everything on there really i am on twitter at tail teller tom and on instagram but they barely ever get updated i'm more of a facebook man myself but it, it, it's all there it's all excellent there. so i will put links to those in the description below this video so that people can pop off and have a look at those if you are interested in getting hold of a copy of forest folk tales for children by tom phillips then you can get that from the history press uh you can get it from all good bookshops probably quite a few bad ones as well uh and from the normal online retailers that deal with these sorts of things uh support your independent bookshops or the publisher directly if you are able to do so will always be my advice in these matters tom or or they could always buy direct from me get a signed copy and it helps me out more because of the, the deal with the history press. I, I, I get more for the book. So, you know, I can feed my children that way. <laughs> Look at that. As you can't go wrong with that, can you? And you can have uh, a signed copy as well. And I'm signed sure if somebody copy, messages you on Facebook, you'll probably write a little dedication in the front for them too. Yes, I, I, I love doing that. I, I feel famous. It's great. And I'm not, but I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. However you want to get hold of a copy, I recommend that you do so. Tom, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and talk about your work on the Folklore Podcast. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Tom. If you want to look at his work in more detail, then do follow the links which he referred to in the interview, which are posted down in the description below. You can also follow those to buy yourself a copy of the book if you want to do so. The Folklore Podcast Book Club and the Folklore Podcast are both offered completely free of charge. If you'd like to help us to continue to make this content, do please follow the links in the description below where you'll be able to visit our Patreon page and support us for extra rewards and bonus content, or make a one-off donation via our website. 
If you can't do either of those things and still want to help, then do please share our programming, share our main podcast and the items that you'll find on our YouTube channel. And do please, while you're here, subscribe to the channel to get notifications when we put up more videos. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you again on the next episode of the Folklore Podcast Book Club. Bye for now.